Hey, good morning, Arundel Christian Church. Man, I wish, I'll tell you what, I wish I knew how to do backflips because this is the kind of week that we have had at Arundel Christian Church. So let me just share with you, give you a little sneak peek into some of the things that have been happening. Uh, first of all, you heard me a little bit uh, share about just the exciting news out of last week, our first, uh, our first service basically last week with three services and everything, all of our leaders throughout the building said, wow, that went so well, and you can see that, we've, that we have some spaces uh, here that we, uh, for some reason, I'm a little bit offended that the first couple rows here are empty. Um, I'll brush better, I guess. Maybe it's that. Um, but I, you, so many cool things are happening at Arundel Christian Church. Let me, let me just give you a sneak peek into one of them. Over the last six months, we've been watching what God has been doing as far as bringing new people into the folds of this church and we have moved from what they call a fair growth rate into what is called in church growth numbers an outstanding growth rate. A 12% growth uh, in one year is considered outstanding. And that's the, where we've been at in the last 12 months or last six months. Now, let me tell you this. We don't want to be a church that just fills up seats with shallow believers. We want to be a church that is doing some really awesome things and not only inviting people into the church but then helping them be transformed into the image of God. So I want to tell you real fast, if you are one of those first-time visitors, and you're joining us this morning, and maybe you don't really know who Jesus is yet, and you're kind of new to the church thing, we're really, really, I'm really glad you're here. The church, we're really glad you're here. We want you to know that you belong here, even before you believe like we do. But we know and we believe that Jesus loves you so much that he has a plan for your life, and we intend to show you that in God's Word so that you can be transformed into the likeness of God's Son. One major change. This is something I'm super excited about. You'll notice we had two baptisms this morning. From now on, we used to have a thing called Baptism Sunday, you know, the third Sunday of the month. We're going to start taking that baptism, that baptistry cover off every Sunday. And the reason why is because we plan to do baptisms every Sunday. Now, it's exciting to kind of watch them pile up a little bit and then to have, you know, a bunch of baptisms at once. But we would rather be, uh, you know, we see in Scripture the idea of there's water, what's keeping us from, from being obedient in, in baptism. So I want to tell you right now, if that's you, if you're in this room right now and you've given your life to Christ, but you've never taken the step of being obedient to baptism by immersion, we got the cover off. You can come see me after church and say, I want to be baptized. And what we'll do, we got shorts that you can put on. We got some swim trunks and a shirt and we got a towel for you. We can baptize you today. And that isn't just true today. That's true next week. That's true the week after that. That's true the week after that. We want to see people take that, these first steps. You saw in the end of that bumper video, that first step into following Christ. We believe that that's an important first step. And we want to encourage you to take that. We, are, we have a lot planned we had a lot going on. We had an overseer retreat this past Sunday, or this past Friday, and so just two days ago. And our overseers, we got together and we spent time on our knees in prayer over the future of Arundel Christian Church. What is this church going to look like, not just in 2018, but 2019 and 2020? We're taking a three-year look into the future because if we believe that this is a fishing boat, which I do, I believe that God has called us with a purpose of, of being fishers of men, right? If we're on this fishing boat together, we ought to know where we're pointing the bow of the ship. We ought to know where we're headed. And then not only do we want to, we don't want to just point in that direction, but we want to then rev up the engines and get the motors going and get moving in that direction. And we came up with some really cool things that I'm going to unveil soon as far as the future of this church. And some of them are really big, cool things. And I'm really, I'm, all of them are big and cool because they're God's plans, but there's some major shifts in our, in our way of thinking that are coming in the future, and we're going to continue to invite people into uh, the kingdom of God. Isn't that cool? So let's pray together, invite God to be with us this morning. Father, I am so thankful for an opportunity to teach this morning. I pray that as I, I notice these first two rows don't have anyone sitting in them, God, you already know the families uh, in this community that, that you're calling to be a part of Arundel Christian Church. I pray that you would help us 
Uh, God, give us the strength and the courage to be inviting those neighbors and friends and family into a relationship with you. God, help us to learn what it means to follow you this morning as we have this, uh, this series that we're in, as we look at Matthew and his account of, of the gospel. God, we want to see what it looks like to follow you, and then we want to have the boldness and the courage to step towards you and to continue to follow you and walk with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know that, that bumper video that we saw? It's just that, that video of a dad who's kind of given the, come on, son, come with me. I got something really cool for you. Uh, I really like having a bumper video to set up the sermon a little bit and to remind you what the series is about. As we're talking about following me, though, sometimes I think that that video is it's not representative fully of what we experience sometimes in our Christian walk. Am I right? Sometimes, yeah, it's this friendly hand, come with me, let's go fly a kite together. And sometimes we're following and, and it seems like just joy-filled and, and it's happy and everything's, you know, go lucky. And it's just like, it's this great experience. But sometimes following Christ isn't like that at all, right? You guys know, I've heard some, a lot of your stories, following Jesus can be crazy hard. Sometimes I think a better illustration of following Jesus would be a hand reaching down like the face of a mountain saying, here, let's climb up this thing together. And that's not easy. That's not this little, come with me, let's go ride a bike. So we have to understand that when we have this call to follow, in your life groups last week, you looked at Matthew chapter 10, and we see that the cost of following Jesus is it's expensive, that there's, there's real cost involved. It's not easy. So sometimes we, we're following, and it's more like something hard that we're following into. And sometimes we're, we're following out of danger. Have you ever found yourself lost somewhere, and you're really happy to follow someone out of it? You know, when I was in, in college, between my freshman year and my sophomore year, I bought a car. And I lived in California at the time. So I bought a car in California, and I planned to use that car at college in Virginia. So I needed to get that car across the country. Now, a friend of mine did the exact same thing. They needed to get their car to Virginia. So we decided, why not plan a 14-day road trip? Let's get our cars there. Let's invite some friends to fill the seats of our cars. And let's just go on this epic 14-day adventure across the country. So that's what we did. We, we each picked a couple friends, and we, we loaded up our stuff for the, for the year. And we got an envelope that we put all of our gas money into. We think, you know, hey, let's just put all of our gas money in this envelope. When we stop for gas, we'll just use it. And this will be great. So we, we rush across the kind of the Midwest because there's nothing there. And we're, we're uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, we're trying to get to somewhere where we haven't been before. And one of our first stops is, hey, let's go to Chicago. None of us had ever been to Chicago. So we get there, and we're like two and a half, you know, three days into this 14-day trip, and we get to Chicago, and we spend a day there. We have a great time. We get back in our cars, and then we decide, all right, as we're starting to drive on the freeway, we both realize that we needed gas. So we, we made a decision you don't make necessarily at any stop in Chicago. We say, hey, the next gas station you see, let's stop and get gas. That wasn't a good choice. There are gas stations you don't stop at. In Chicago, we learned the hard way. So we stop at this gas station. The next one we find, it's, we don't know our geography. It's this area of Chicago called Cabrini Green. And we stop at this gas station and we get out and I pull out my envelope full of cash. And uh, I'm not thinking, right? And I, as I walk in to go into the, grocery, or the, the gas station store to pay for my gas, the, the lady has beat me to the door and locked me out. She doesn't want whatever's about to happen to happen in her store. So I don't understand why she does that, but now she's pointing over at the window to pay through the window. I'm like, all right. So I go, and now I'm uh, over at the window. And before I even have a chance uh, to pay for both cars, I pay for one car. I haven't yet paid for the other. A police officer in an unmarked car pulls up puts his lights on immediately, he gets out of the car, he's wearing a white t-shirt, he's got a bulletproof vest over the shirt, he's got a ponytail, I mean this is like a hardcore cop, this isn't your normal cop. He gets out and he's scared. 
I'm not lying. He gets over. He's like, you, get over here, you, you. And he's pointing at me and my, my five friends, and he's telling us to come close to him. And then he calls for backup. Nothing has even happened. I don't know why he's doing this, but he's calling for backup. He doesn't feel safe, just him and us. So backup shows up. And the whole time I'm saying, I've already paid for gas. Can I get gas? He's like, no. Can I just, just in one car, no. Can we go to the bathroom? No. And finally, this, this backup, this other police officer, same sort of get up, shows up. And they point at this spot on the cement where there's a red stain. And they said, that was from last weekend. They said, there is no way, if we hadn't driven by, that you would have left this gas station with that envelope and with those cars and the things in it and maybe your lives. And then he tells us, listen, I'm going to go in front. Your cars are going to follow behind me. This other car is going to follow behind. Uh, So two police officers basically sandwiching us. And he's like, we're going to drive and you stick with us. I'm going to drive through red lights. You just stay with us and I will get you back onto the freeway. And that was one moment where I was so thankful to be able to follow because I didn't realize what I'd gotten myself into. And how many times is it like that? We find ourselves stuck because we do our own thing. We do go our own way. And we find ourselves lost in a mess that could have been super dangerous. And then Jesus steps in and says, listen, I don't need any backup. Follow me. It was just this moment to, to realize that when we're called to follow, it's not always just this friendly little hand that says, come and, and go with me. It's going to be awesome. I believe that it's going to be awesome, but it's going to be hard too. And specifically today, I want to talk about a part in Matthew where we're called to follow. And and this is specifically a call to community. I believe that God wants us to go with him, to follow him into a community of believers. Think about this for a moment. Last week we talked about a call to love. We're we're supposed to follow Jesus' example in the way we love others. We are also supposed to follow his example in his call to community. And community, another way of looking at that is like family. We're called to treat each other like family. Didn't you know that? We're called to treat each other like brothers and sisters. And we're going to see some analogies here in Matthew together. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to spend the day or the morning here uh, in Matthew 18. If you are new to the Bible, I just wanted to encourage you. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. So the Bible split up into two parts. There's the Old Testament, and then there's the New Testament. Matthew's about three quarters of the way in, and it's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are your Gospels. Those are your uh, first-hand accounts of the good news of Jesus. So Matthew chapter 18. We're going to spend some time there, and let's start with the first four verses. Here's what it says. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child, had him stand among them, and said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn around and become like, these, uh, become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You notice there that the chapter starts with the phrase, at this time. So in other words, what just happened in chapter 17 was uh, this thing called the transfiguration. And ultimately what happened is Jesus invited his three main guys to go with him. And they experienced this incredible thing together. You can read about it in chapter 17. And then ultimately what's happening now is the disciples, they have 12 of them, right? The 12 apostles are realizing that there's maybe this little tear of favoritism going on. And in that moment, in this like favoritism of wondering, like, who's the best of all your guys? Which one of us is your BFF? You know, is what they're wondering. And Jesus says, listen, you're getting this wrong. Let me explain the humility that's required to be a follower of mine. And he goes into these four verses, and he ultimately says in verse 4, whoever then humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Here's ultimately what's happening here. I'm going to put this phrase up on the screen. It says, to be a citizen of the kingdom, you must be a child of the king. To be a citizen of the kingdom, you've got to be a child of the king. 
Ultimately, what he's saying is when you humble yourself and you recognize that I am the king and you, and you submit yourself and, and you become a child, and you hum, humble, I know you're this great person. You, you know, I'm looking out here and, and I'm speaking to myself too. We got these great plans and these great things and we've done some cool things until we can humble ourselves and realize that we're nothing compared to the Father and submit to his lordship and become the children of the king. He says, there's, there's not, the, you'll, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. To be a citizen of heaven, you have to be a child of the king. You see what's happening here is he's using this analogy of a father and a child. And we, he's using a literal child in this. You know, he, he pulls a child close to him. And sometimes what we do is we get caught up in thinking that all of these next verses are just about children. Hey, be like a child. Don't cause a child to stumble. But what he's really saying is you and me are children of the king. This is about us. He's using a literal child to paint this picture of you and I are kids. You, get, you and I are, are children. I picture, you know those videos that you can look up on YouTube where a father uh, or a mother is, has been deployed in the military and they're coming back and they surprise their family? You know those videos I'm talking about? Uh, I'm picturing one I saw just the other day. There's a girl and she's sitting in class. And the class, the subject for the day is they're honoring the military. And she actually is able to share how her father is deployed and what he does. And she has a chance to participate in this. And at the very end, she's sitting down in the back row of this class. And you just the camera is right on her face. And you can see her go through like three or four different emotions in the matter of two seconds. The first, as her dad returns, a surprise. She doesn't know her dad's in the building. As he comes into the room, you can see on her face this total disbelief. Like, am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? And then it immediately changes to this, like, tears of joy start immediately streaming down her face. She doesn't care at all about what any of her classmates think about her facial expressions right now. She's just so overcome with emotion. And then she pops up and realizes, I can actually go over and... and, thrust myself upon my dad and give him this hug like she has dropped all pride in this moment like humility is out the window and when you recognize that you are a child of the king that's what that looks like you just long to understand and to long to you humility is is becomes paramount because you don't care what anybody else thinks it's like running through that airport. You've seen those people before. They don't care that they've dropped their bags and that their mascara is running and that they whatever. They don't care what anybody else in that room thinks. They just want to get to their father and give him a hug. And that's this humility that we see here. Whoever then humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That leads us to this question. Are you a child of the king? Do you have that kind of humility in your faith? Are you willing to to understand and not care what anybody else thinks about this relationship that you have with your Abba Father? So keep this this picture in your head of, of a father and his children. Because I think it's important. One of my favorite lyrics of a worship song, it's a new worship song called Bethel or by Bethel, called Pieces. And in the song, there's this lyric. It says, your love is wild for me. It isn't shy. It's unashamed. Your love is proud to be seen with me. This is uh, the way I believe that God looks at us. God is proud to be seen in our presence. He's glad to put his arm around us and say, this is my child. I'm super proud of Matt and what he's doing. This is my child fill in the blank. I'm so proud of them. It doesn't matter what it is you got going on in your life. It doesn't matter your reputation. It doesn't matter what's going on. God is proud to be seen with you. Do you have that same relationship with him? Let's keep reading Matthew 18, 5 through 6. It says, and whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. Now remember, we're not talking about children now. When God is admonishing us not to necessarily uh, hey, make sure you go volunteer up in Kid Point. That's important. But what he's talking about is you and me, the, the person in your seat right now. You're the child, okay? And whoever welcomes a child like this in my name welcomes me. 
But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a huge millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the open sea. You see, we are children of the king. And what he's saying is what I would probably say. Listen, if you want to come and you want to like mince words with me, I can take it. You want to come and you want to like yell at me and point your finger for a little while, go for it. I can even take a punch, okay? You try to pull that on one of my kids? Doesn't that change the whole ball game? You know, you mess with me all you want. The moment you mess with one of my kids, that's what Jesus is saying right here. It would be better to tie a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the sea. That would be a better ending for you. That's how much he cares about his kids. I, uh, I found this blog that I really, because I have three daughters, this was a blog from a dad to a figurative boy in the future that wants to date his daughter. So he, he prepared a letter to this future boy that wants to date his daughter. And here's, the, here's some of the things he had to say. Number one, it says, My daughter's heart is a fragile thing. If you play with hers... I will show you yours. <laughs> if you ever find yourself alone with my daughter, don't panic. Just correct the situation immediately. If I ever catch you trying to get alone with my daughter, that would be the time to panic. It may sound like I'm joking and threatening you harm. And while I might not physically hurt you if you offend my daughter or violate her honor, When I am addressing the issue with you, you will not be laughing. This is the way that I, I'm like, yes, I'm going to just copy it and give it to every boy that wants to date my girls. Like, this is the way that, that, that dads, when they look at their children, they say, listen, you can, I can take a punch, but don't mess with my kids. And this is the the community, the the family that God is setting an example for us to want to follow. He's saying, listen, this is how much I care about you. I want you now to care about each other this way. In fact, we're going to see that here as we define what community looks like in the rest of this chapter. So number one, community defined. What does it look like? The first thing is we protect one another. We protect one another. We see this. In verses 7, 8, and 9, it says, Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. It is necessary that stumbling blocks come, but woe to the person through through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into a fiery hell. This is like that blog. (laughs) This is God writing a blog to to you and I as as other children that want to be a part of the family saying, Listen, don't mess with my kids. He wants us to protect one another. In fact, if he's the father and I am the son of the king and you're a son or daughter of the king, what does that make us? It makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. And I ought to to care about you and to protect you. And it shouldn't just come from me down. It, 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 It should be the person sitting next to you in the aisle behind you and in front of you. We ought to care about and love each other like family in this place. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is incredibly hard to do in a church of 1,200 people. Which is why I'm going to say this once, and we're going to, I'm probably going to say it again. Life groups are so crucial in your faith community. Because in, in order to have community, in order to have someone who's protecting you and guarding you and doing the things we're going to talk about, it's not going to work when you have 1,200 people as well as it does when you got you're surrounded by a group of people who, who really know what's going on in your life. We protect one another. We should be concerned about each other's holiness. We should be careful to make decisions about what we do and what we say and what we wear and what, we, uh, what jokes we, we say and what movies we take friends. we got to be really careful to, to protect each other because that's what brothers and sisters do. We watch out for one another. 
we should be radically committed also to our own personal holiness. If there's something in your life right now that needs to be cut out, like destroy it. Do whatever you can to cut it out of your life. Here's a second thing we see in in this example set for community. It's number two, we care for one another in community. Let's read the next five verses, uh, verses 10 through 14. So see that you do not disdain one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If someone owns a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go look for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice more over it than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that one of these little ones be lost. So we're talking about the way Jesus cares about us, right? We see this sincere care that he's willing to go after the one that's lost and leave the 99 that are on the right path there while he goes to search after the one that's gotten lost. But we see at the very beginning of that, see that you do not disdain one of these little ones. In other words, he's saying, listen, church, I want you to behave the same way. I want you to have this kind of care and compassion over each other within the church. I want you to seek after the one I want you to have that kind of genuine care. I remember when I took a, a group of middle school students on a missions trip about five years ago to the very, very tip, topmost part of Maine. And we were all done with the trip. We had all of our bags packed. All of them were loaded in the trailer. We had a 15-passenger van that was our mode of transportation, and we had a schedule to keep. In the moment we had finished praying, everyone got in the van we, it wasn't me, I promise, uh, but the guy who was driving the van had lost the keys to the van. And in that moment, right, th- this is it's so high up in Maine that if you just call a locksmith, he says, oh, I'm in Bangor, I'll be three, it'll be three hours. You know, this is not a, a, an easy solution. So we're sitting there and we're all looking everywhere. We search the whole place, we're trying to find these keys and we, we, we're checking in everyone's pockets and we're checking like all over. And eventually we realize maybe the keys are in our luggage. So we unload our whole trailer and everybody has to go into their bag and see, is there keys in there? Anyone who slept in, in this cabin, maybe you somehow, the keys ended up. We're looking everywhere because we know they have to be somewhere. We tore that place up until we finally found the keys in the pocket of the guy who was supposed to have them. That's why when you ask, you know, you're lost and someone's like, no, no. I'm like, let me check, <laughs> which is weird. Uh, but listen, when you have that kind of fervor, like, listen, I'm willing to, I'm willing to unload this trailer to find these keys. I'm willing to look through. We, we ended up being like four hours behind schedule trying to find these keys. It was important to find these keys. And when we have that kind of a passion, when we see a brother or sister who's, who's kind of going off path and we're like, man, I care about you. I want to do whatever I can to make sure that I'm not the reason that you're stumbling. I'm willing to go after the lost, but even more important, I want to make sure I'm not the reason that you went off on the first place. We see in John 10, 27, 28, it says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish No one can snatch them away from me. No one can snatch them away from from God. I picture that uh, that scene from Taken. You know, uh, Liam Neeson, his daughter has been uh, kidnapped, and he's on the phone with a guy who has his daughter. And my impression is going to be terrible, so just I apologize up front. He says something along the lines of, I have a special set of skills and I am going to use them to find you. And when I find you, I'm going to... It would be better to tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself in the water. <laughs> is what he's basically saying, right? That is the kind of care that we see in Scripture that the Heavenly Father has for His children, you and I. And we ought to have that same care and love for our brothers and sisters around us. Here's another a definition of community. In community, we restore one another. We restore one another. I'm going to be honest. I even take the blame on this. We 
really stink at this as a church. We don't do a good job following Matthew 18 and what it looks like to restore a brother when they're struggling in sin. And the reason why is in our culture nowadays, we have a word for that. When you go up to someone else and you point out something in their life that doesn't seem right, what word gets thrown up real quick? Can anyone know? Shout it out. Judge, yes. What are you judging me for? This judgmental, like we, nobody likes uh, to have this kind of conflict. But here's what, what Jesus says about it. In 15, it says, If your brother sins, go and show him his fault. When the two of you are alone, if he listens to you, you have regained your brother. You see that word brother there? This is the family that we're talking about. But if he does not listen, take one or two others with you. Now get the whole family together, okay? They're not the whole family. Get like the, your immediate family together. And take one or two others with you. And at that, at the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now get the whole family together. And if he refuses to listen to the church, treat him like a Gentile or a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you release on earth will have been released in heaven. Again, I tell you the truth, if two of you on earth agree about whatever you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. But where two or three are assembled in my name, I am there among them. This is incredible. This is this this four-step process that Jesus calls us to as a church. He says, I want you to love each other so much. Number one, listen, we're so committed to personal holiness that when a lot of times the reason we can't confront a brother about their sin is we're stuck in the exact same sin. And we don't have, uh, and, you know, we haven't taken the steps in our own personal life to be in a spot where we can say, hey, brother, listen, I know that there's something better for you. Let me, let me call you to it. So number one, we need to be committed to our own personal holiness so that when there's opportunities to encourage a brother or sister in Christ, we can do that because it's biblical and it's what God calls us to do. In family, we restore one another. No one can speak better into my life than my wife. Because of the connection we have, because I know that she loves me, because I know that she's committed to to making me the strongest man I can be, when she speaks into my life, It doesn't matter if I don't like what she's saying. I listen. You see, when you have that kind of a relationship with other believers, when you know that they love you and they care about you, you are able to then speak truth into their life. And we need to do that. In fact, an author named Carl Laney wrote this. He says, The church today is suffering from an infection which has been allowed to fester. As an infection weakens the body by destroying its defense mechanisms, So the church has been weakened by this ugly sore. The church has lost its power and effectiveness in serving as a vehicle for social, moral, and spiritual change. This illness is due, at least in part, to a neglect of church discipline. See, if we recognize that this is a fishing boat, that we are all called to be on this boat and to share an urgent and radical mission of catching men. If we do that and recognize that, then our mindset should shift and we should understand that the purpose of this boat is more important than your feelings. Like the, the purpose and, and mission of this ship is, the, is what's most important. And we need to do everything we can as a church to love each other and to make this boat and everyone on it as effective and efficient as possible in catching men because that's what God's called us to. And when we allow people within our family to just to struggle with things and we, don't even, we just don't bring it up because we, we think it's none of our business, I think we're doing a disservice in the community that God is calling us to. God is calling us to speak truth into each other's lives. And here's a fourth that we see here in chapter 18. In community, we forgive each other. We forgive each other. For the sake of time, we could go read the rest of Matthew chapter 18. It's a really cool parable. I encourage you to read it on your own. But ultimately what's happening here is there's there's a guy who owes uh, another person. Say he borrowed money. And if you were to convert this money to to modern dollars, it's somewhere around like a billion dollars that he owes. 
an amount that none of us in this room likely would ever be able to fathom how to ever pay that back. He owes just a ridiculous amount of money. And then when he's brought to court and told that he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail or maybe even be killed because he owes this debt, the person who loaned him the money forgives him as he pleads for mercy. He says, listen, I've heard your plead for mercy and I'm going to give it. I'm going to forgive your debt. Can you imagine the, the relief that man must have felt? He just got forgiven completely a billion dollars worth of debt. And then that same man walks out of the court and he sees across the way a, a, another guy who owes him money from Starbucks last week. He's like, hey, you, you owe me that five bucks. Wait, the Starbucks, like ten dollars, you owe me, right? You owe me that ten bucks. And he has no mercy on the person who owes him ten dollars when he was just radically forgiven of a billion dollar debt. That's what this parable is about. And we look at that and we hear that story and we're thinking, that's completely ridiculous. How could anybody have that little mercy inside of them? But listen, when you have someone in your life, whether it was from 20 minutes ago or 20 years ago, that you refuse to forgive for something that's going on in your life, something that they did to you, something that happened, when you're unwilling to forgive, you're basically saying, listen, I know, Jesus, that you forgave me of a billion dollar debt. But I'm not willing to show that same mercy to others around me. And if you think that in your life that your sin isn't that great, you don't understand the holiness of God. If you're saying, Matt, Matt, Matt I, I understand that, that God has forgiven me of my sin, but I'm a pretty good person. He didn't do that much for me. You don't understand the holiness of God, and you're lying to yourself. In fact, I believe if you're not the biggest sinner you know, you probably don't know yourself very well. We are messed up people who have been showed extravagant grace by a perfect and holy God, and we're called to then show and extend that grace to those who have wronged us. Now listen, I want to be really clear on a couple of things. The Bible doesn't say that forgiveness is easy or natural. It just says that it's right. Think about that. And we forgive not because they deserve it, but because we didn't deserve the forgiveness that was shown to us. So we extend it to others. So here's how I want to close. As we understand what community looks like, that we protect each other and we care for one another and we restore one another and we forgive each other, I hope that you can see how important it is to be involved in a life group because it's so hard to do these things, to have this kind of community in a setting like this. It's so hard if you're counting or leaning on me as a lead pastor of this church to be the guy who speaks into all of your lives in these ways because there's just too many. I can't. We need to understand that we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we need to have community in this church because God's calling us to follow in his steps. So if you do me a favor and bow your head with me. I'm going to read a few questions and the reason I'm asking you to just kind of lower your head is so you're not distracted by anything that's happening in this room and just listen to these questions and I'm hoping that one of them really resonates with you. Maybe one of these questions you would hear it and you would say, you know, I think God that question was for me. Here's the first one. Are you causing a brother to sin? Is there something in your life right now that maybe is causing someone in your family? Maybe you're, you're causing your children to sin. Maybe you're, you're causing your spouse or leading your spouse into sin. Maybe there's something going on at work and you're, you're causing a brother to sin. How about this question? Are you guarding and protecting your own personal holiness? I want to encourage you to remove it drastically and completely. Here's another question. Are there ways that you can better care for others around you? Is there anyone you need to confront about their sin for their good and for God's glory? Here's a really tough one. Are you harboring 
any unforgiveness or bitterness. This past week or maybe 20 years ago, something that you need to let go because it's going to tear apart your soul. How about this? Are you in a life group? I want to encourage you to to listen to these questions and to ponder how and maybe which one of these questions you need to take action on this week. Because I want to encourage you, God has called us to follow him into community. Let's pray together. Father, we give you this morning. We ask that everything that happened here would have been glorifying to you. I pray that you are honored by, uh, by this time of corporate worship. As we have these opportunities on Sunday to gather together and to worship you together. God, we hope that you you know how special and important you are to us. God, we want to be and fully recognize what it looks like to be children of the King. Thank you for protecting us. Thank you for restoring us. Thank you for caring for us and forgiving us. Now give us the courage to follow you and to go and do likewise to those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.